Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to what is now the 20th edition of the Coffee Microcaps Morning Meeting. Uh, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who's joining us for the first time and for any of our regular attendees are very welcome back to uh, this edition. Uh, compliance and disclaimer. Uh, for anybody who's joining us for the first time and the structure of the webinars, we run it over an hour. Each company gets uh, 30 minutes where we're going to break that down into 20 minute prezzo and 10 minutes of Q&A. If you do have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box uh, on your screen in the control panel. Please don't use the chat function. It's, it's much more effective if we use the, the Q&A box. Uh, please also note that the webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel probably tomorrow. So if one of the presenters you know, runs over a slide a bit too quickly, you can go back and you know rewatch their presentation then. Uh, if you want to follow Coffee Microcaps, uh, Twitter is the best place to find us. We're at C Microcaps, uh, as I said, the YouTube channel for recording of this webinar and all previous webinars we've done this series. We're also on LinkedIn, where I do some more additional long form content. And uh, I also run a weekly paid newsletter where I focus on one um, ASX Microcap stock every week. That's at the Coffee Microcaps Substack platform. Our first presenter this morning is going to be Mr. Robbie Sharan, Sipser CEO and co-founder of High Pages Group Holdings Limited, which uh, just IPO'd recently uh, in November. And we're going to follow that up. Then we've got Mr. Peter Cook already on the line with us from Novati Group. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first presenter. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. Robbie, uh, if you want to just pull up yours. Um... Should be on your screen now? Yeah. yeah, I can see it. Robbie, you're ready to go. Awesome, awesome. Thanks for the introduction, Mark. Uh, I'm Robbie, the co-founder and CEO of High Pages. I, uh, I'm going to go through today with um, a little bit about High Pages. But I might just kick off by saying that High Pages is the online platform that connects Australians with trusted tradies to simplify home improvements. Put it simply, if you need something done around your home, whether you need an electrician or a plumber, um, High Pages is the way to go to get you connected with a qualified, vetted and registered trade business. We do a really good job of that. Um, in terms of the agenda today, I'm going to go and do a little bit of a deeper dive about High Pages and how our business works. Um, talk about our strategy and then spend a little bit of time on financials and obviously open up to questions and answers. So let's go into uh, the story of High Pages. Let's go back to 2004. So the business has been around for over 16 years. As I said, I'm the co-founder and the, the reason why the business was started was there was a personal, it's a personal story. I purchased an apartment with my wife and uh, the place was very run down, needed a lot of rent innovation work but the issue was is we didn't know where to begin in terms of engaging and hiring trades the process to get permission with council and body corporate was incredibly complicated we didn't know if we hired the trades if they um, didn't know how to project manage needless to say there was a lot of friction in the process and there had to be a better way and uh, we set out to build high pages after doing a bit of research and speaking to the trades uh, as well, we found that they also had a number of problems, different to consumer problems, but they had some problems as well. Really good at their craft, just had challenges with marketing and promoting and amplifying their reputation online. And uh, also were just very slow in adopting technology. And uh, we've you know, taken time to refine our business model. Uh, we've had some really, really nice milestones along the way. News Corp is a major strategic investor in the business um, and still are today post listing. Uh, we've won some really, really strong partnerships with the likes of Bunnings, Ray White and Ikea, and more recently the New South Wales Department of Education. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail in a few slides to come. But yes, as Mark said, we listed uh, late November 
on the ASX and uh, we were very pleased with that and uh, obviously now a very strong uh, balance sheet to help us execute on our strategy, which I will also talk about shortly. Before I go into a little bit of detail on the actual core business, I think it's important to just do a little bit of a high level discussion about what, what we've created. So we've uh, created one of the highest or the highest quality network of trades in Australia. We are across all of Australia, including regional areas. Um, it's a very large and growing addressable market. I'll talk about how large the market is shortly. In terms of the business itself, uh, we have had well over 3 million jobs or requests for work posted in the platform since inception. Uh, in the past, in this year, this financial year, we are anticipating we'll do over one and a half million job requests through the platform. And because of the high quality network and the volume of work that we're putting through the platform, uh, that flywheel effect of the double-sided marketplace is really in effect. Um, in terms of the business model, we are a subscription uh, business model. I'll break that down as well in a few slides to come. And the revenue that we generate is 90% recurring revenue. So trades that purchase a product of us commit to a recurring contract. In terms of the business as well, which is not covered on this slide, it's worth mentioning that we are EBITDA positive and we were EBITDA positive in FY20 and continuing to see acceleration in our margins as a company in 2021. In terms of the macro environment, like just to understand the category itself, in terms of households in Australia, there are 9.9 .9 million Australian households. There are 257,000 trade businesses supported by the 1.1 million tradies that um, work in the country. Not everyone would know this, but when you aggregate all of the trades, like the plumbing and the electrical work, uh, the actual value of the work is around $83 billion that's generated by, by the industry. And that's significant. It's approximately five to 6% of the GDP of Australia. And, uh, you know, that does kind of make sense. When you go down the road, you look at uh, uh, the cars in the street and you often see, you know, at least, uh, you know, one in, one in five to one in 10 of those cars being a trading vehicle. Uh, in terms of the advertising spend in the category, uh, a little under a billion dollars is spent on advertising and marketing to amplify and promote their reputation. Uh, we are fortunate in that the category is increasing its spend at around 8.8% .8 per annum. And we're enjoying that shift from traditional marketing and advertising to digital and online marketing. And that shift is um, anticipated to continue well into the future. The other thing that's really worth noting is that lead generation, uh, lead sourcing platforms like High Pages uh, provide the best return on investment for every dollar invested when you compare that to other marketing channels like maybe search engine marketing or social advertising or even word of mouth when you have to pay for referrals and things like that. In terms of the experience, I'm going to talk through just actually how the mechanics of High Pages works. So just imagine you're a user or a homeowner or a consumer that has a problem and in this case a blocked drain in your kitchen sink. You would go into the High Pages app or you would go onto our website and fill in a form uh, we would ask you a bunch of, of questions about the issue that you've got um, to understand it. If you can attach some pictures, that also is very helpful. And what our algorithms do is, what they do is they connect you with the most appropriate trades in the area. And the first three trades that have shown interest in responding to your job will be connected to you. And that's what you're seeing in the first card, that connection process of the three trades that have been now vetted and checked um, you can also, uh, and then connect it to you. you. You can then also look at those profiles. We provide ratings and recommendations, business registration, businesses have been hired of their past work. Um, you can get a good indication of the type of business that you've been connected with. And what then happens is the tradie will then start messaging you uh, to either arrange a time to quote or potentially give you a quote in the messaging center. And the cycle is completed at the end of the job with you providing um, feedback, you as a consumer providing feedback and continue to work on that flywheel effect that happens in a marketplace um, where you provide your recommendation if, they, if that trade has done a good job. In terms of what happens on the tradie side, the tradie comes to high pages. They provide us with the criteria of the type of work that they do and the areas of where they want work. And what happens is, is work is then sent to those tradies in their app um, or on a, mob, on a desktop, and they can select the type of work that they wish to do. 
Um, they might not select all of it, but they can pick and choose the work that they want. Uh, and then once they're connected, uh, they can message the consumer, call the consumer uh, and do their quoting process and then request for payment for when the work is done. And then at the end of it, you know, ask for the feedback, which completes the cycle of the transaction. So let's go a little bit deeper into how the actual mechanics of the platform works. So we use incredibly sophisticated algorithms that uses, you know, millions and millions of data points to make that match work as fast as possible. So the typical experience for a consumer, if you've had the opportunity to use high pages is if it's a traditional trade type work that's in a metro area, you would likely get connected with a trade within 10 to 20 minutes for your first connection, within 20 to 40 minutes for your second connection, and then within the hour or two, your third connection will have happened. And then the process is that you, you know, obviously engage that trade to work out who you want to use and the work gets done. Uh, the algorithm uses a number of variables. Uh, these, are, these aren't all of them, but these are some of the key ones, such as the distance the tradie is to the job, the recency of activity that the tradie has in the platform, the type of customer or tier of the customer. So obviously if it's a customer that has a larger subscription with us, they will need more work so that we may show them more, more volumes. And the tenure of the tradie is also important in the algorithm calculation. And that's all optimized to get the perfect connection of three, three trades to your job request. In terms of how the business works from a monetization perspective, as I said earlier, we're a subscription uh, business model. We transitioned in November of 2019 from being a transactional subscription model to a complete subscription model with recurring contracts where all customers pretty much roll onto a 12 month contract at the end, end of their first tenure. And the first tenure is typically six or 12 months. Um, in terms of how the subscription utilization model works, a really good example is let's take a look at the starter package. If you're a tradie or so let's say you're an electrician that's uh, purchased the $99 a month subscription product, uh, you would be given $125 worth of lead credit. Now, the jobs that come through vary. Small jobs may be priced a little lower, bigger jobs are priced higher. But let's say the electrical job is an average price of $25. That electrician, electrical business or electrician business um, would then be entitled to uh, five, to claim five leads in that month. Obviously $25 into $125 gives you five. And that's how the subscription utilization model works. There are a bunch of other additional value adds, but for the purposes of the presentation, just trying to keep the concept simple, um, the, that's how the, the subscription model works. Now, High Pages has been migrating uh, uh, its customers uh, over to a subscription model. And we're very focused on that subscription number. Uh, we had in our 2020 positioning at 28,000 trades. We continue to migrate our customers over to subscription. The reason behind it is, is the ARPU per customer is better. The retention rates are significantly better um, on a subscription product. And um, effectively, it's part of the strategy of High Pages to move into a SaaS and ultimately platform business. And uh, the best way to do that is through a subscription product where you can throw in additional value added, value added products into that subscription and results in better stickiness and better engagement with the trades. And we're on that journey of delivering on that strategy. On the right hand side, we have, as I said earlier, over 3 million consumers posting jobs today. That's at the end of FY20. Um, that number will probably increase another half a million unique new users. Really important point to mention on this slide is that the majority of the jobs that are posted on our platform are actually repeat customers. At FY20, that was 60% of our jobs were repeat. Um, we are anticipating one that will be already increasing even further again. Um, that just demonstrates the power of investing in brand, uh, the power of uh, people knowing that you are a trusted network and obviously um, some of our, our, those big brand partners know that that network is the most trusted in Australia. Um, in terms of the partnerships that we've, we've, we've been able to uh, implement, uh, we successfully uh, have, have had a partnership for many years with IKEA. We help them with their kitchen installations and bathroom installations. Ray White, uh, when all new homes are sold, we provide a package to new home, homeowners on allowing them to do some home improvements um, through vouchers and, and uh, Ray White Concierge promotes high pages to new homeowners to use our platform to get things done around the home. 
And with Bunnings, we are one of their major uh, installation partners. Uh, we provide them with installations for a number of services, such as toilets and light and fans and heat lamps, uh, uh, sink mixers and, and the like. So uh, we've been partnering with Bunnings for a couple of years now. And uh, we did a partnership with the New South Wales Department of Education, where High Pages is the go-to platform for the New South Wales Department of Education to support the 2,200 public schools in New South Wales for their small works um, procurement process. And uh, that's live and in market. And uh, we're very, very proud of that partnership. There was a, that, that just demonstrates again, the quality of the network where you have our tradies now going into uh, schools uh, and working in, in, in an environment with children, which um, demonstrates that we've done all the necessary checks and criteria to make sure that that is done in a safe way. So that's very strong and a testament to the network that High Pages has built over the last 16 years. In terms of investment in brand, uh, historically, a few years ago, we were very focused on Google, you know, advertising, search engine marketing. We, 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 um, the majority of our jobs, you know, over 55% was coming from uh, paid, paid, you know, digital paid marketing. Uh, we made a decision two years ago to uh, stop that. Um, obviously, search engine marketing is a critical part of the marketing mix, but we use it more in a tactical way and represents a small proportion of our job volume today. Uh, we made a decision to invest in the brand and we've been a T1 sponsor with, the show, with a show like The Block for a couple of years now and we have seen significant increase in our brand awareness. The most recent brand dip, um, so that's when we go into market and just check um, how much awareness there is on the High Pages brand and that's moved significantly from 28% to 56% in the last two years alone and so we will be continuing to invest in the High Pages brand into the future as we continue to see the success of the flywheel effect of the marketplace and then obviously that then washes through into uh, greater margins and profitability because of the efficiencies that that generates and the goodwill that it generates. Um, if I spend a little bit of time talking about our technology, we've been in AWS for many years. We, we have nearly a perfect record for um, uptime. Um, we have also created uh, flexible engineering capacity. What that means is, is, as most technology companies in Australia are experiencing, there is a constraint on hiring uh, qualified uh, uh, high calibre engineers to develop the technologies and the products and features that we want to roll out. And so we partnered with a company called ThoughtWorks and we have access to to a very large talent pool abroad that uh, is helping us deliver on our strategic plan. We're also a very data-driven business. We use immense amounts of data to support it, nearly all variables of the business, all aspects of the business, I should say, uh, from our sales functions right down to that connection and algorithm that makes that ideal connection with your job to the, um, the shortlisted three tradies that you get connected with at the end of the process. Um, I'm going to go now into the strategy of High Pages, spend a little bit of time just explaining where we're going as a company. Uh, a few years ago, we looked at the category and decided that we wanted to be the um, leader and we are certainly winning in the category. We have the largest network of trades. We are totally focused on having vetted, qualified, registered trade businesses in our platform. That is our USP. Um, we do a fabulous job of we are four tradies, one of the main lead sources for their businesses, and that whole connection and quoting and communication piece is done really well in the platform. We obviously are now been very much focused on encouraging that repeat behaviour by building our brand, and we've been doing that really successfully. Um, we also have another channel on the left-hand side that represents our retail partners, such as IKEA and Bunnings, and the fixed price installations that we have with Bunnings. The left-hand side is what we would call channels or where work comes in from homeowners and consumers um, into the trading network. In terms of our focus in the current horizon, um, we have uh, invested quite heavily in workflow management. So workflow management is effectively field service software. High Pages acquired a business in early 2020. Um, we'll be in market in H2 commercializing that product and integrating it as part of a bundle with our subscription products. Field service software is the tool that trade businesses use to help with their quoting, scheduling. We see ourselves as professionalizing the trading industry and helping them adopt, adapt, uh, adopt technology, I should say, um, to make them more efficient and more productive so that they can do more work. From a commercialization perspective, obviously there's a monetization impact to our business, but strategically, 
um, it creates um, high pages as a more stickier platform for the trades. And in terms of additional channels that we're exploring, we see property management as an interesting space that we will be exploring in partnerships. And um, in our community channel, I mentioned government falls into that. Um, and uh, we, we've obviously had a really successful uh, partnership with New South Wales. And there are other departments that we are in discussions with around further rollouts in the future. Um, in terms of the broader ecosystem in the category, there are a number of other channels on the left-hand side that I've just illuminated. Uh, we don't do a lot in the insurance claim repair space. Um, that's something that we could look at in the future. And we also don't do a lot in the commercial office and retail repair and maintenance side of things. Uh, but there's also opportunities there for us to explore or partner with players that are in that space already. In terms of ancillary services or future uh, benefits that we can integrate into the High Pages platform. We see significant opportunities in the banking space where we would be able to provide lending and fintech solutions for trades, potentially buy now, pay later as the tradies could become merchants, insurance for the trades. Um, we also see really big opportunities in the procurement around subcontractors, tools, vehicles, rental equipment hire and material sourcing, um, all really critical parts that are fundamental to running a successful trade business. We see some really big opportunities in there and uh, we'll be exploring that in the future, in, in future horizons when we execute on that part of the, the ecosystem. We're also, we're also building incredible data assets. Uh, we have millions and millions of records on consumers and you know, we have data on a large proportion of those 250 Southern trade businesses in Australia. We see media products and further enhancements of our core products and ancillary services in the future from those data assets, which is super exciting. How are we executing on that plan? Well, we have a mobilization execution plan. This is all driven by metrics and outcomes. Um, we, 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 um, we track this um, regularly. It's rolled out across our business. Everyone in High Pages knows where we are on this plan. Um, the Pink Horizon was effectively work that we did in FY20 and some in FY19, decisions to change the subscription only product, investments in building brand improving the unit economics of high pages so that we could be profitable in FY20 and investments in our technology so that we could deploy uh, new products and features faster in the future horizons. Um, if I look at the teal horizon, the middle one, our focus uh, in this current horizon is to deliver on field service software, um, expand into new channels such as uh, government, the government work and potentially property management um, and continuing to be the brand authority for the on-demand trading economy in Australia. When we look ahead um, into future years, so in a couple of years time, we see uh, some really nice opportunities, as I said in the previous slide, in the fintech space, insurance claim repair side of things and the data side of the business is extremely exciting. Uh, all will be fueling uh, future growth and hopefully expanding our growth rates in the future. I'm going to spend a little bit of time just talking about our financials so you can see how um, see and understand the scale of high pages and where we're where we're at as a business. Um, we recently just announced our Q2 results um, that on the ASX website you can download those They're publicly available and also on the high pages corporate website. Um, so we had a really strong Q2 very strong performance across all our key metrics. Um, we continuing to see that shift to subscription. Our brand awareness is really growing, as I said, from 28% to 56% in two years. Uh, so we're seeing some really strong dividends coming through from, from that uh, uh, investment. Um, we had a very successful IPO, very strong balance sheet. We have well over 30, 30 million, 31 and a half million um, of cash and funds under, under our control with no debt. Um, so we're in a very good position. If I go into a little bit more detail on actually the performance for the quarter, uh, so we were we are forecasting a 15% revenue growth. Um, we are actually tracking ahead of that. Um, we finished the quarter on 18%, but the number that I really want to draw your attention to is the recurring revenue, which is going to be the main line of revenue for the business and where uh, we're seeing really strong growth. Uh, in Q2, we saw 26% growth, um, and uh, that's that's an important metric to talk to. Um, and our monthly recurring revenue is also increasing at a rate of around 31%. So that just to be clear, there's another lot to come on the recurring revenue. Uh, that's a GST inclusive number. And we're well ahead on our job volume. We're enjoying the benefits of, 
the um, tra transition to online and the recent acceleration, possibly due to COVID, to online, and we're seeing significant volumes of jobs coming into the into the high pages platform. So there's no challenges on the demand side, and we're up year on year on that. Um, we've been very much focused on trying to get more quality jobs to improve the value proposition to our tradies. Um, and you can see 94% of our total revenue is now recurring. So we're on track to deliver our prospectus numbers. Um, very excited about that. In terms of the recurring revenue, you can see that that's been growing nicely. Um, you can see that that shift and decision to do that transition started to see recurring revenue accelerate, um, particularly in the last year. We can see that continuing to accelerate into the future, particularly as we add more product and value into the underlying service that we're offering to our tradies. In terms of the subscription base, we've been very focused on doing that transition of tradies. Um, we are up you know, year over year on, on our tradie subscription numbers. Uh, top line trading numbers have been going down, but that's due to us focusing primarily on quality trades. We've put in the prospectus that we will have 30,000 uh, subscription tradies by the end of the fin year, and we're on track to that. So that's also a really strong thing because that will help with retention and support our ARPU numbers, which is what is on this slide. Um, our ARPU has really um, started to move. Um, uh, subscription tradies have a much better ARPU than um, transactional customers, uh, actually three times more revenues generated from a subscription customer than a transactional customer. So uh, that transition and decision to move to subscription was a critical decision. And obviously now that's washing through into really healthy EBITDA margins, which you'd expect from a business of our age and um, you know, comparable platforms like car sales and REA, uh, gen generally once they start to get traction and market leadership, to you know, wash through really healthy EBITDA, which, which we are doing. Um, Mark, I'm at the end of the presentation. I hope we're good for time. I'm open to questions. Yeah, we're a little bit tight for time, but hopefully we can squeeze these in. We've actually got uh, two questions just around um, the, the drop in tradies or, or the churn that you've seen as you've moved to the subscription model. Um, can you maybe just you know, talk about how you're trying to prevent people that's already signed up, not uh, not losing them off the system and trying to cajole them into the subscription model. And, you know, I think slide 12 shows the number of tradies falling, but that last slide you're showing, you know, tradies on the subscription model is increasing year over year. So just maybe a bit more context on, um, I guess, the churn you're seeing as you switch models. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, with regards to the churn, I can I can say that the churn is improving. Um, I think we made some commentary on that in the recent announcement. Uh, so uh, uh, in regards to what we're doing, the reason why we went from a transactional product was that trans transactional products typically have a much higher churn. Um, and and uh, Type of customers we want to bring into the platform. We're looking for customers that are more engaged, um, are interested in growing and develop their businesses more. Um, in, in terms of the transactional customers, there was less of a commitment, um, less of a spend. Um, the subscription customers now have an account manager um, dedicated to them. They have additional benefits from going onto a subscription product. We give them bonus lead credits for their loyalty. Um, we uh, give them some pause functionality in their account, which is kind of hard to do in subscription. But subscription also is a gateway for us to bundle in additional value adds, such as the field service software, which when you have a more engaged trade allows you to sell, or not sell, but provide them with better functionality, better tool, tooling to help manage and run their business. So they are ultimately more profitable and successful. And we can demonstrate more clearly in those products, the ROI. So there's a lot of extra product and features that we can throw into a subscription product that was very hard to do in a transactional product. And uh, because we're going into the subscription and the ARPUs are going up, generally higher spending customers have a much better retention rate than lower value customers. Okay. And then maybe uh, this is more on the, on the actual functionality. I'm going to combine two questions into one for the sake of time here. But how do you track or what percentage of the jobs posted on the platform are actually filled through high pages as opposed to, you know, going off channel or offline? And then can the consumers pay direct via the platform to the tradie? Okay, so I'll answer the last question first. Yes, the consumer can pay the tradie uh, via the platform. We have a payment uh, solution that's embedded in the platform. Uh, invariably, the nature of the business that we provide 
is one of connections and um, the businesses that are on our, they are businesses. They're not, we're not their sole, um, then we're not their sole source of work. A lot of them have repeat work or established businesses. So we can't force the entire engage, engagement to occur within our platform. Um, and, and that's what we call this intermediation. Uh, with regards to uh, keeping them in the platform, you know, we're investing quite heavily in uh, messaging and telephony technology to keep the connections happening within the platform. But we don't want to create friction on what will result in a good outcome for the consumer. So they may pick up a plumber from the platform, but the next time they need that plumber, it doesn't mean that that plumber will be available. And so they come back to high pages, which is what we're seeing. Or you don't necessarily need a plumber every week or every month or every once a year maybe, but uh, you, you might need an electrician next month and you might not have the details of, of the electrician. So you come back to high pages to use the electrician. I think strategically, the really important thing to call out is that's why we invested in the field service software. We don't necessarily care if they go off platform or use, um, use other means to get payment. Uh, as long as we have visibility and the field service software product will give us the ability to see not just the work that we generate and the outcomes of the work that we've generated, but all outcomes for all their work, whether it's word of mouth or from another marketing source or lead source or channel source, um, we, we get that visit, we'll have that visibility and provide business intelligence to the tradies about how they're performing. Okay, I'm going to steal a minute now from, from Peter and Sorry, uh, Peter. Ask, ask, <laughs> ask, ask for forgiveness uh, afterwards. Um, just very quickly, is um, m and expected to form part of the growth strategy going forward or is it pure organic? So we, we, we look at the category. It's a really, really um, big, big market. Um, we have a very clear and defined strategic plan and we're executing extremely well. I'm very confident about the management team and the company's ability to deliver on that plan. Um, so m and if it happens, it, it comes along, but the focus will be, focus will be on um, delivering on our organic and strategic plan, which we're doing an exceptional job of. Okay. Robbie, we're gonna to have to leave it there, I'm afraid, but thank you very much for the presentation and, and getting through the questions as quick as you could. If you could please stop sharing your screen and then I'll ask Peter, our next presenter to start sharing his. Uh, Peter, I can see the cover slide of your presentation now, so you're ready to go. And uh, uh, thank you for accommodating the slide run over on the first one. Oh, no. uh, thanks, Mark, and uh, great to follow Robbie, actually. Uh, so for today, uh, Novati Code NOV, what I'd like to do is quickly go through a general uh, thesis on the, pace, the space we, we sit in, a presentation on Novati, and then lead to, I'd call it an investment thesis about uh, why, why uh, or and how funds have been talking to us and, and uh, where, where we fit in. So if I put, put some background to, to, I'd call it the general space of payments. Uh, let, let's start with a simple thing, the Hain Royal Commission. We've, we've seen that, that as a result of that, uh, the big banks are vacating, say, the wealth management space. And, and in a similar uh, vein, they're, they're actually in many ways vacating the, the payment space or not, not investing into it. Um, we're seeing digital, digital transformation. We're seeing absolute growth in digital payments, uh, uh, general theses such as mobile first. And, and an overall thesis that we have is that licenses and tech are absolutely critical for any sort of disruption in, in a space such as payments. And so hopefully you'll see from Navati that, that we're uh, driving on some of those uh, background um, uh, theses to, to build uh, a very strong sustainable business in this space. We, we are a legit, leading digital banking and payments company. And at the moment we say a banking company because we are not a bank, but we are providing a range of services that uh, uh, payment services that banks do provide. And uh, as I'll discuss, we, we are well through a process of br bringing through a bank license to, to add to our overall payments business. So we are providing multiple services. Um, traditionally, we'd have been called a payment service provider, but we do what's called issuing, acquiring, cross-border payments, 
and subscription billing. So multiple payment services in one house and with, with a long-term aim of, of adding a bank license to that. For a history of the company, uh, we listed about five years ago, we listed very much as a technology company and really for the first two, two and a half years of our business, that's exactly what we were. We've really uh, spent the last two to three years transforming ourselves into a financial services company, uh, payments and uh, uh, very much recurring uh, or near to recurring uh, revenues. And, and then uh, absolute acceleration over the last 18 months as we've brought through additional financial services licenses, uh, license with Visa, additional uh, global partnerships, and, um, and really started to, to use those to, to drive our revenues. In terms of the, the board, um, specifically our chairman, Peter Pavlovich, uh, also on the board of Dubba, Family Zone, um, uh, Ventnor or VRX. Uh, so a number of uh, very successful listed companies and he has a very strong uh, capability of, of uh, directing and leading companies that are platform businesses and disruptive businesses. My, my own background is as an entrepreneur across multiple businesses with many exits to uh, Australian and US listed and private companies. Uh, and our other three directors, um, uh, one lives in Mauritius, one in Hong Kong and one a mixed Australian Chinese uh, residency, uh, all payments professionals. Uh, and in particular, our Hong Kong director, Kenneth Lai, uh, himself owns a very large payments business in, in Hong Kong and a number of payments companies in uh, other company, uh, countries, New Zealand, uh, Hong Kong and the UK. So from, from a board point of view, a lot of ASX experience and, and an extreme amount of global payments experience. We, we generate revenue uh, from multiple sources. Um, so in, in payment terms, we are a card issuer and for the last 18 months have been able to issue visa cards. It's uh, been a difficult uh, license for us to get in the, in the, the governance and uh, uh, diligence requirements to get to, to get to get to that point are quite considerable. We've been able to build a very unique business um, in, in terms of a comparison on, on the Australian market. Uh, eMerchants is, is a very large uh, card issuer uh, with a global footprint. At the moment, Novartis card issuing is Australia and New Zealand, and, and we are making considerable gains in that space. Uh, payment acceptance, so essentially either online or on a merchant, where, where a consumer can pay for something. Uh, we, we've got a very deep experience uh, in the Chinese payments, uh, Alipay, WeChat and so forth. And we're just adding on the more traditional payment methods such as Visa, MasterCard, uh, recurring EFT payments and so forth. Uh, Cross-border payments, we're very strong in. We do some uh, couple of billion dollars a year in cross-border payments and, and I think the the uh, great thing there is one it is a absolute mega business in terms of global size the World Bank talks about uh, 700 billion dollar uh, business uh, but what it really needs is deep experience in governance and compliance and that really underpins a lot of the other work in our business and allows us to keep uh, building on our licenses and capabilities and uh, get approvals from various partners. And then uh, we also have very strong revenue streams from our traditional technology clients uh, and, and a very, very uh, strong growing part of the business is around subscription billing. Uh, you've seen from high pages how, how the, um, the, the digital economy requires uh, uh, very specialist billing services. So we, we provide that for, for many clients in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, through a platform we call Immersion. And uh, we announced late last year that we would take that business to the US and we're on tr uh, this quarter and we're on track to do that. So a uh, very specific uh, part of our business, we, we bought the subscription billing business to, to actually access the, the payments off the, the back end as such and, and build our uh, merchant acquiring business. What we've realized is that the, the underlying capability of subscription billing is so important in today's economy that on its own, that's just a great business to build. And uh, as I said, we've, we've invested strongly and, and are taking that business to the US uh, and we'll sign up our first customers either this month or next month. 
<clears throat> from a bit of history and, and more to go to capability of our company in terms of the, the technologies we deploy, uh, absolute tier one clients such as Cafe, where we provide uh, some underlying uh, tech for, for the loyalty component within their Marco Polo Club. Uh, Telstra, we provide a couple of uh, major platforms into their mobile payments area. Uh, Hutchison Telecom, similar. And then over a number of years, we've provided services into Canada Post. And as an example of a fintech client, ePay in Australia, which is part of the uh, US Euronet group, we, we provide extensive services for them around uh, uh, web portals uh, or payment portals, uh, issuing and acquiring services. An, an absolute thematic of uh, growth. Uh, we're all across the general um, term of digital transformation, but within the financial services sector, uh, it, it's being accelerated and within payments even more so. And, and, a, and a simple measure of conversion of cash to cashless, uh, to cards, whether they be physical or digital, uh, lots of statistics like this, but uh, really at a high level view, we are right in that uh, thematic of conversion of uh, traditional forms of payment into more um, uh, digital forms and, and you know, eventually leading into digital assets, cryptocurrencies and so forth. Looking at our performance and uh, uh, summary of our financials, uh, we've been growing the business at about 50% revenue year on year for the last four years. Um, the, if, if we look at our sales revenue, uh, $3.79 million for the quarter, about seven and a half million for the year. And, and that's been growing, that, that is growing at a bit over 50%. Our total revenue last half year was about eight and a quarter million. And on that basis, uh, on, on a run rate of uh, north of 16 million for the year. And, and so that, that uh, long-term revenue growth at 50% per annum, we, we aim to increase that and in, in fact accelerate it. We, we have a, uh, a strong balance sheet now with circa $9 million in funds at the available funds at the end of December. And we are really using that to, to drive revenue growth. Um, in the, in the uh, June quarter last year, we were circa cash neutral. In the September quarter, we were about $100,000, uh, we call normalized EBITDA positive. And in the recent quarter, we've been negative uh, EBITDA of about uh, $700,000, really uh, as part of the strategy of using our balance sheet to drive growth. So we are at the moment running a strategy of top line growth, but very sustainably with it within our balance sheet so that there is uh, no, uh, no come raise sort of uh, situation based on, on the growth of our business. And, and, and actually, if I can just go back to that, the, the revenues that we're talking about, the sales revenues of $3.79 million, if you get that as recurring or near recurring based on the, the transaction frequency, uh, well over 80% of that is recurring or near recurring and, and not a sort of a, a lumpy one-off sales type revenue. The work we've been doing over the last couple of years and, and really accelerating during the last couple of years, the, the last uh, calendar year, is really about building infrastructure. Now, infrastructure for us is platforms, it's licenses, and it's partnerships that we can monetize. And so over the last 18 months, we, we've announced uh, partnerships with Visa, where we are what's called a principal issuer in Australia and uh, as of a couple of weeks ago, an associate issuer in New Zealand. Uh, Union Pay, uh, we've become an acquirer for them a couple of months ago. Uh, Alipay and WeChat, we've done extensive work with them over the last uh, three years. Alipay late last year awarded us Innovation Partner of the Year in, in Australia. And on, on the uh, issuing side of our business, in the last six months, we've brought through Google Pay, Samsung Pay and Apple Pay uh, for us to be able to, to um, provide their wallet services. Now, uh, just as an example on those three, not trivial. In, in reality, in Australia, you've got the, the major banks with their, their issuing services, uh, e-merchants and two or three other companies. And that is, plus Novati are really the only companies that are doing this full suite of um, wallet type payment services. And then I just mentioned Marquetta there, 
uh, absolutely great uh, prepaid card or, or actually a card processing company out of the US heading towards a, a multi-billion dollar float this year. Uh, we are what's called their bin sponsor and issuing partner in Australia. And, um, and that, uh, again, that sort of relationship uh, follows extensive due diligence by them and uh, just shows the capability of Novati to deal globally um, with these sorts of companies. Uh, not on this slide, but, but we announced uh, late last year that we had partnered uh, on, onto the Ripple network uh, for doing cross-border payments. And again, that, that will allow us to both send payments out of Australia into their network, and more importantly, to be a receiving partner of theirs for fast settlement of their uh, globally sourced cross-border payments. And, and, and again, just from the December quarter, some of the internationalization of, of our company, uh, we announced that we'd been licensed in New Zealand to be what's called an issuer of product. And then in January, we, we announced that uh, Visa had given us uh, their associate issuing license there. We announced uh, last calendar quarter that we would take the immersion platform into the US uh, this, this calendar quarter, and we're on track to have our first customers in February or at the latest March of this calendar quarter. And that will be a very large growth opportunity for the company. And then uh, Ripple driving into Southeast Asia for cross-border payments uh, really extends a lot of our services and, and deepens our margins in that area. So uh, growth strategy, and in fact, really an overall corporate strategy. Uh, the background thesis of demand for digital and, and associated with that factors such as, uh, uh, as I mentioned from the Hain Royal Commission and just a general thing that, that banks, traditional retail and commercial banks are vacating or not investing in the payment space. So demand for digital, a uh, whole lot of payment services, new types of payment services and traditional banks not meeting, uh, stepping up for that sort of demand. Uh, when I say platforms, we're not just talking tech, but we do. We've got years of uh, fintech platforms and we, we're building that all of the time. But financial services, licenses, compliance services, um, uh, various governance capabilities, uh, plus our people, plus commercial partnerships. So, so those whole, uh, let's call it infrastructural platforms of being a payments business and, and one that can deal cross-border and, and in multiple services and a strong balance sheet. And so if we, we combine all of those, we are really uh, aiming for accelerated growth. And then as a long-term thesis, to bring the bank license that we've been applying for underneath that, so we've got absolute security of our position as a bank and, and to be able to build uh, services such as, cross, as um, uh, correspondent banking and to be able to deepen the margins and increase wallet share as we can provide more services as a bank. So as an update on our flight, we announced, uh, did announce about three years ago that we would um, go into the regime and, uh, and aim for one of the new bank licenses. We were essentially uh, funded and, and at the door, ready to be issued a license late March last year. And, and in early April, uh, APRA announced there would be a six month uh, delay and then a further six month delay and hopefully they will reopen licenses uh, next month in March. Uh, Novati, uh, we, we are absolutely ready, willing and able and at the door to, to uh, take that bank license and uh, we will be able to then apply a lot of our services, a lot of our customers and the customers of our customers to very quickly uh, be able to drive the, the customer acquisition for our bank and, and be able to really then have a, a, a I'd call it a super uh, platform of bank plus other licenses, plus technology, and all facing into this digital transformation thematic. So uh, absolutely ready, willing, and able to build what we would call a payments bank, which is just a, uh, uh, something that hasn't quite been seen in Australia. Uh, as a comparable, you, you've seen uh, Tyro, which is very much a merchant acquirer plus a banking license. You've got eMerchants, that is a card issuer. You've got uh, Ausforex that does cross-border payments. Uh, the aim for Novati is to be able to provide all of those services underpinned by a bank license. My contact details there, 
And, and as a final slide, uh, really around share market performance, uh, which you know to some extent over the last 12 months has been uh, 20 cents to about 25 cents. Uh, and obviously we're trying to drive for, for a lot more uh, 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 return to investors and shareholders. Um, code is NOV, we've got 227 million shares on issue and about 30 million options with various strike prices of 20 cents to about 60 cents. Uh, cash on hand of about $9 million and the top 20 shareholders uh, control a bit over 60% of the stock. Mark, thank you very much. That's great. Thanks, Peter. Um, I'm, I've got a couple of questions that were emailed in ahead of time for somebody who couldn't join this, yeah. but they're going to watch back the presentation. Yeah. Uh, one is on the 9 million of cash. The question is, yeah. uh, is any of that kind of earmarked as regulatory capital you need to hold for various licenses or the upcoming banking license? Um, the, the, none of that is regulatory capital. No, so, so the bank license uh, will not use any of those funds. Okay. And then the second question is about the, the US expansion. And um, does that require, you know, headcount on the ground, opening an office there, having a, a kind of an authorized company rep or, or, or a sales team in there, or, or can it be done remotely from Australia? The, the um, uh, we, we will uh, hire a, uh, a, a uh, let's call it a, a sales leader or a uh, business unit leader there and a very small, uh, what I'd call channel sales team and a couple of, uh, initially one, but then a couple of uh, operation support people. The, the, the primary method of growth for, for this service will be online and through the uh, market. Hi, sorry, Peter. Yes, I'm back. Oh, we're back. Okay, sorry, I'm not sure what happened there. Let me just repeat the question. Um, yes. Would uh, consolidation within the industry, I mean, uh, you mentioned some of the other players. Uh, the question is, you know, would, would Navahi consider being a consolidator or is m &A part of your kind of strategy moving moving forward over the next kind of three to five years? So I've been talking about organic growth, as I said, at circa 50% per annum for the last four years. Uh, it, it's absolutely a part of our strategy to uh, do m and and be uh, a consolidator at the moment and, and absolutely build scale and you, you know, the great thing about payments businesses is once you get through that, that uh, break even point, the scale just gives you uh, immense leverage into your uh, bottom line. Um, and, and the scale will come from size and it will come from deepening of margins with additional licenses and, and additional capability. So uh, we at the moment see ourselves as a, an aggregator and, and a builder and sure markets uh, at some point, you, you know, uh, an aggregate or can become an aggregate here, I guess. Yeah. And then uh, w one question I might just ask, ask myself, because I just happened to be looking at the, the visa results the other day, you know, they're suffering a lot from the lack of cross-border transactions because it's quite a high margin business for them. Um, have, has that lack of cross-border transactions because of COVID and pe people not traveling, uh, it kind of impacted you guys at all? Have you have you seen that coming through as a as a I don't know a a, a COVID impact to, to the Navahi business? Yeah, so so it's caused change. So if I can start with the drop offs to answer your question, so we were underpinning and doing a lot of uh, let's call it cross border payments. A Chinese tourist or student at a tourist shop in Australia and they'd make a payment and we'd get a small clip of that. So obviously those inbound uh, in-store transactions have dropped, but, but that is balanced by the online payments that, that many of those same people are doing as they pay you know, the rates on their property or, or their telephone bills or uh, many uh, education courses and so forth. So our online uh, variation of that is growing very strongly. And in terms of the very traditional remittance type cross-border payments, we, we have seen some drop in some cases. Uh, so, so, and, and in particular, back in April, May, June last year, you can imagine, say, I don't know, a taxi driver from India uh, has suddenly lost, you, you know, an Indian um, non-resident non -resident Indian, someone in Australia 
He's lost his work as a taxi driver, suddenly can't as easily send money back home. So there was a drop in that, but in fact, it's now picked up back to pre-COVID levels. Okay, great. Um, if we don't have any further questions from the audience, I think uh, I'm going to leave it there. Uh, Peter, thanks for tackling those questions that came in ahead of time and for your presentation and time this morning. Uh, we're going to squeeze in just under the hour, even though we got off a minute or two late with you. And I would like to just remind everyone that we're going to have the recording up on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel probably by uh, midday tomorrow, if anybody uh, missed anything there when we sort of dropped out for a second.